This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiecki is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Gwilda Wiecki's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Science of Magic or endorsed in any manner by Gwilda Wiecki, Relmar McConnell Media Company, its affiliated networks, stations, or employees. Welcome to the Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiecka, a program dedicated to uncovering the unified nature of reality and humanity's ever-evolving place as truly galactic beings. For more information on the Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiecka, visit us online at www.thescienceofmagic.net. Welcome to the Science of Magic, a program combining the science and magic of today's leading topics to co-create new solutions and promote evolutionary thinking. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. This hour, we'll be exploring purpose. Many of us come with a driving sense of purpose. Sadly, only too often, we die feeling we never lived it. This was driven home as I sat by the deathbed of one of my shamanic clients. He and his wife wanted me to be there to help him cross. His last words shook me to the core. I miss the point, he exclaimed. Life is the point, and I never really lived it. He'd been a driven, altruistic man, much loved by all who knew him. He'd always been on a quest to find and fulfill his purpose. During the death process, he confessed he felt that he'd failed to do either. It's all too easy to look for meaning outside of ourselves while life passes us by unnoticed in the frenzy of our quest. Yet there are those among us who came to serve at this time. How can we find a place and purpose without missing the point in our search? Our guest this hour may have some guidance for those of us on this very quest. Vernon Kitabu Turner is the author of numerous books, including Soul to Soul, Harnessing the Power of Your Mind, Under the Sword, Life's Lessons to Awaken the Zen Warrior in You, and his latest, Kiesana Zen, Bridging the Gap Between East and West. Kitabu spent 20 years under the guidance of Himalayan Dharma, eventually being named a Dharma successor charged with bridging the gap between East and West. Vernon Kitabu Turner is also an ordained Christian minister and has been called one of the most prominent voices of our time in the international anthology, The Way Ahead, which featured his work with that of Dalai Lama, among other notables. His website, soulsword.com. Kitabu, thanks for joining us on The Science of Magic. Thank you, Gwilda. So have you personally experienced a driving sense of purpose? Oh, yes. All of my life. How, How young were you when you really started noticing it? I think um, I really became aware of it when I was about nine years old. Was there a particular event or anything that led up to that? Oh, yes, there was. I had an epiphany when I was at uh, church with my parents one uh, Sunday. And um, what happened was the preacher was preaching about um, the atonement of which Christ was on the cross. And I had a mystical experience of being transported back there. 
Mm. And uh, in that experience, I felt the weight of the world upon me and the wretchedness of my condition. And um, when I was back with the congregation, I was, I could hardly bear it. And um, when the preacher called for any um, person who had had an experience to come forward, I went. And when I went into his arms, I felt suddenly cleansed. I felt transformed and uh, as if I was filled with light. And um, that experience lasted me for quite a while. And at that moment, I felt a compassion for the world. I wanted to reach out to everyone and share that experience with them. That was my first uh, uh, spiritual experience. It sounds very, very powerful. What denomination was it? Well, I was in a Baptist church where I don't associate it with a denomination. I see that as a more of a universal experience mm. because it's not, um, it wasn't, we're, go ahead. We're going to have to take a break and pick up on the other side. Kitabu and I will return shortly, so don't go away. Okay. You're listening to The Science of Magic. Our current episodes are aired daily on the Exxon Broadcast Network, xzbn.net. In service to our listeners, our prior innovative episodes can always be accessed on our website, thescienceofmagic.net. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the x Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. I am Dr. Carl O'Helvey, founder, president of a new cancer foundation focusing on evidence-based physical, mental, and spiritual interventions, including natural cancer cures, prayer, meditation, affirmations, nutrition, and other related holistic cancer prevention and cure modalities. These are used in cancer education, research, and financing care. I ask for your help to continue this important work by donating at www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. Wouldn't you love to know the secret to everything? I'm Dr. Kimberly McGeorge, and on The Secret to Everything, we will merge the practical with open investigation into all realms of the mysterious. We will talk to cutting-edge alternative health practitioners, those who inspire and motivate you in business and life, 
And of course, we will share stories of the paranormal, conspiracy, and cryptozoology. You will transform because of the frequency I carry, the frequencies my guests carry. Life may never be the same after you listen to this program, for the secret to everything is for you, the listener, for those who desire more in every area of their lives and believe that it can still be found. Listen and discover thesecrettoeverything.com. Little children aren't the only ones afraid of the dark. Millions of soldiers return from war zones with PTSD, anger, frustration, fear, and loneliness, much of which surfaces during the darkness of the night. You have the chance to change the lives of these American heroes. Songs and Stories for Soldiers.us provides free MP3 players for these men and women. With a list of 3 million songs in 16 different styles, 100,000 audiobooks, and 30,000 old-time radio programs, every veteran can find something to soothe and comfort them at no cost. All our players contain an 8-hour audio program designed to help veterans fall asleep. With 1,500 plus vets now participating, it's our goal to deliver 10,000 audio players this year. Go to our website at Songs and Stories for Soldiers.us. Help us help a veteran make it through the night. Welcome back. This is the Science of Magic, dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. Our guest this hour is author Vernon Kitabu Turner, his website, soulsword.com. Kitabu, I understand you spent quite a while in the martial arts. What forms did you study? Well, I started off um, with jujitsu. But um, from there, I started a little karate and all. But uh, my d- deepest experience in it was not through the formal, but through my awakening that I had that caused me to see into the nature of Bushido. And um, that's what I became known for. Um, I was able to take a leap in the martial arts to go from white belt to black belt without any spaces in between by taking the trial by combat. That, that sounds, was, yeah, that sounds was, pretty intense. Well, that was a rare experience in the West, even though that has been done before in the East. Um, what happened is the teachers could see that I had grasped some understanding and they wanted to test it. So they put me through um, various trials and I was able to pass through all of the trials. And uh, in my first experience of a trial, I walked in with a white belt and came out the first day with a third degree black belt um, and from, from then on, I was uh, ranked higher through subsequent tests. Kitabu, what do you th- where do you think you were getting your information? Where did you tap in to know how to do all the moves to pass those tests? Well, I learned that later from my my guru teacher, Prajna, instinctive wisdom that we have within us a ocean of instinctive wisdom that if we can tap into it, all kinds of uh, knowledge is available to us. And so I was able to tap into that because I had lived a meditative life um, most of my youth and I didn't question it. So... How do you mean you lived a meditative life? I... um spent time in silence from my youth, from my, um, you know, just sitting under trees and 
going by the river and sitting there and being quiet, searching within myself. And I didn't know what I was searching for. I just felt a call to search within. Mm. Mm -hmm. After four, I became in contact with teachers. What part do you think martial arts played in your life's path? Well, it gave me a form to deal with, something uh, you could see and something other people could see. So it was like a, a, a beacon. It, it gave people something to view in the way I carried myself, my continence. And they remarked on it. And that triggered my uh, inspiration. You know, in, in 1967, you were initiated by a Zen master. Would you mind sharing a little bit about that? Okay. Well, how I came to be aware that Zen ex existed was through um, a paper I had done in school. I had written an essay, and my English teacher in Eastern District High School uh, asked me if I had studied Zen. And uh, she said her husband had a degree. He was a, he had a doctorate in Oriental philosophy, and he had read my paper and wanted to know if I studied Zen. And I told him that I did not know anything about it. So they gave me a gift of a book called The Three Pillars of Zen, by Philip Carplo. And um, when I read it, I was uh, inspired because it sounded like how I felt. And um, that summer, I was um, going, I was in the park. I was going through a deep period of depression. And I went to the park and I was feeling so depressed that I prayed out and asked God to remove it from me, or if he did not do that, to remove me from the earth, because I could not take it any longer. And at that moment, uh, two things happened. A bird was flying overhead, and it dropped its waist on my head. And you got to love that. <laughs> I said, oh, no, even God has turned against me. Mm. you know. But then the wind whipped up and blew very hard, and it started to push me, and I was compelled to follow it. So I went in the direction the wind was pushing me, and it even pushed me around the corners. And uh, so I got on the train and rode the train until I was compelled to stop. And uh, I, was, I was in New York at the time, and I went to Greenwich Village and I got off at Washington Square Park. And when I got in the park, I felt the spirit of peace come over me. And I kept walking and I saw this man sitting with a kimono on and his hands folded as in prayer and gosho. And uh, I waited. And when he looked up, he asked me how could he be of service to me? And I said, I'm interested in learning about Zen. And he said, I'm a Zen master, newly arrived from Japan. And there were 10 million people in New York. And in that one moment, I was drawn to him. Mm. That was the miracle. And mm. he invited me to come to his uh, Zendo. And he was the one that taught me how to sit formally and she Shikantasa, to just setting practice of, of Zen. But that's how I met him, through a mystical experience. You know, as you, as you speak, Kitapo, uh, several times I felt overwhelming sadness. Was there um, a sadness in your childhood that you think helped you to um, start seeking so early? Yes. As a matter of fact, um, I think that sadness or deep sorrow was what was moving me in my youth. Um, um, one of the things was there was a, um, 
a schism between my father and me, and um, that disturbed me. But um, beyond that, there was this deep sense of um, separation from the world. Mm -hmm. So like you came in with a sense that there should be better connection or more connection than what you're experiencing? Yes. Would you tell us about your experience with the Himalayan Dharma? Well, that also came about through a mystical experience. Um, that was about 10 years after I met the Zen master. And um, I was in Virginia. And a friend came by and told me that uh, she had read in the paper about this guru that was coming, that was in town. So she gave me the newspaper to read. And I read the the article, and I saw the name Sadhguru Sonkeshapadas. And when I read the name, I felt emanations from the name, and I knew I had to meet him. So I um, said, let's go to the, hear him. So she and another friend and I decided we would go. And when I went to the Aquarian Age Yoga Center to see him, I was um, caught because when I looked at him, I saw a white light shining around him. So I questioned my friends to see if they saw it also, but they said they saw nothing. So when he finished speaking, I knew I had to talk to him privately. So. When he, when he uh, was finished, they took him in a back room and I went back there and they had guards on his door. But I had already been training in my Zen experience and I didn't stop at the door. I just kept walking as if I was going to go through the door and they opened it for me. And when I went in, he was sitting with some with just a few disciples. And I bowed and touched my head to his knee. And he put his hand on my head and began to pray for me and um, to bless my mission. And um, at that moment, I thought that was all there was to it. So I got up to leave and I walked out, of, I was walking out of the building when Om Kadash, his uh, disciple of 18 years, a Swami, came behind me with a rose. And he said, the master said to give you this. And when he held up the rose, I felt as if the whole universe was coming out of the rose. And uh, I started to cry. And... Uh, then I turned around and went back with him. And when I went back in, the guru stood up and he said, this is my son. And he embraced me. And um, from that moment on, we were like one for 20 years. I was uh, close to him. I was, I was always able to be in contact. No matter where he was in the world, he would always receive my call. And when he came into town, I was always with him. And he began to guide me through my um, education and consciousness in a more formal way than it had been before. And Have you? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, several times now, you've uh, mentioned things that indicate that you're 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 pretty intuitive. Have you always been intuitive like this? I think so. I think that it was a natural thing for me. And you know, you you've been that way ever since you can remember, huh? Yes. Hmm. Fascinating. Fascinating. Well, we're going to have to take another little break here. When we pick up on the other side, I'd like to hear a little bit more about the Himalayan Dharma you worked with and the effect that it's had in your life. 
Kitabu and I will return to our discussion on the other side of this break, so don't go away. We're coming to you through the Exxon Broadcast Network. Don't miss the other fine shows and hosts on xzbn.net, and there's a gang of them. You're listening to The Science of Magic, your resource for creative solutions in a changing world, thescienceofmagic.net. Hi everyone, Rob McConnell here, and I wanted to spend a moment on internet streaming. Everybody has heard about internet streaming, but not many know much about it. Did you know the internet streams just about everything? Movies. From new releases to old classics. TV shows. Almost every show, every episode, and much more. But the question has always been, how do you do it? Well now, thanks to the folks at 123 Ready TV, I have the answer for you. They have developed a simple program app, 123 Ready TV, that you install on your Windows PC, Android smartphone, or Android tablet that can have you streaming like a pro in less than five minutes. You truly won't believe how much is available or how easy it is to do until you try. And for a one-time cost of only $19.99, this product is a real winner. To learn more about 123 Ready TV, visit our website at www.xzbn.net. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. How would you like to be able to read other people's minds? Well, the next best thing is here. When you know how to read a person's name, you know how the person thinks, feels, and behaves. Each letter in our name holds a key to unlock our true essence. Our name contains both our gifts and challenges in this lifetime. Nemology Science discovers personality secrets hidden in the placement of the letters of our names, including the first and last impression people remember about us. Sharon shows us how to interpret the arrangement of letters as outlined in her book, Know the Name, Know the Person. Sharon Lynn Wyeth created Nemology Science after 18 years of research and testing her theories and has supported thousands of people around the world in understanding themselves and others better. You'll enjoy Sharon's unique teachings as she shares her system to learn the gifts behind your given birth name. Even if you don't like your birth name, there are jewels in this book. If you're thinking of changing your name, ready to name your child, or wanting to get along better with others, this is the book for you. If you'd like to improve your relationships and change your life for the better, get the book today. Know the name, know the person. Or visit www.knowthename.com. That's www.knowthename.com. Take a step back in time and discover old Florida cuisine at Marsh Landing Restaurant in Felsmere, Florida. Enjoy delicacies such as frog legs, gator tail, catfish, and swamp cabbage, or enjoy the more traditional cuisine such as hand-cut Angus steaks, ribs, and seafood. Join us for breakfast with a southern flair featuring sweet potato pancakes, biscuits and gravy, and much more. Planning a party? Marsh Landing's private dining rooms can accommodate groups from 8 to 80 people. While you visit, enjoy the historic pictures, artifacts, and stories that line the walls. Marsh Landing is truly a unique experience. Marsh Landing Restaurant, 44 North Broadway in historic downtown Felsmere. Or visit marshlandingrestaurant.com. Marsh Landing, Old Florida cuisine at its best. Welcome back. This is the Science of Magic, a place where magic and science come together to promote enlightenment. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. Our guest this hour is author Vernon Kitabu-Turner. 
his website, soulsword.com. Vernon, we were talking about uh, the Dharma that you worked with um, and your teacher. What is a Dharma successor exactly? Well, it means that you have the authority within to continue the teachings. It's just yeah. not like... Um, it's not like by rote, it's an inner transforma- transformation. And I understand that you are a Dharma successor. So it is said. <laughs> I understand you're also an ordained Christian minister. Where were you ordained? In um, North Virginia. Mm, what, what church? Grace Temple. How long ago was that? That was about um, 12 years ago. What drew you to becoming a a minister? Well, remember that my first experience was with Christ. What I talked to you about earlier in church, when I had that experience, that never went away. Mm. And I did not choose to be a minister, uh, as as a matter of fact, I was sitting in that particular church as a visitor when one of the other ministers got up in the church and started to speak and pointed to me and said, "Um, God has called you to be a minister. And... uh, did you turn around and look behind you to see who they were talking about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Things like that kept happening to me. <laughs> you know. And um so the um the pastor of the church took me uh, it was a woman, took me under her wings and groomed me for the pulpit. And uh I did not find any conflict because it happened in the same way as the other things that happened, through a mystical or direct line of experience. Mm, mm-hmm. how, how are these four things, martial arts, your initiation with the Zen master, your time with the Himalayan Dharma, and becoming a Christian minister, how has that re- redirected your life? Well, one thing about it, it all points to love. Believe it or not, it all points to love or uh, and our uh, relationship to humanity because even the martial arts deals with love. Um, it's made me more aware of my relationship with other beings and um, with the martial arts thing, it helped me to become more aware of my physical relationship with my balance between myself and others. And with the spiritual, with the Dharma, it was about universal consciousness, the cosmic mind. Where do you think your life would have gone without them? I don't know if I would have had a life. Mm. I can't imagine my life without these experiences. Tell us about the shifts in consciousness you experienced as a result of this path. Well, one thing about it, the most noticeable thing that happened first was when uh, I had the Satori, I experienced no hesitation between action and reaction. I was um, sitting and then I was standing without feeling any motion. And I found out I could move without any hesitation. And I was experiencing all kinds of phenomena, like um, something as simple as washing the dishes when I didn't even realize I was going to be doing that. I was walking past the dishes and suddenly my hands were in the water, washing them and putting them away. 
things like that were happening to me. But I also experienced phenomenal things like being able to run faster and jump higher. And um, my martial arts ability went from conscious to unconscious because I had studied consciously for a while. But when it went unconscious, I was able to move without thought, without being aware of how I was going to move. And um, I wanted to find out how deep that went. So I went for tests. I always, I never did trust my own feelings alone. I wanted to be tested. So I went to see masters and let them put me to the test. And um, they will put, do their, put me against their best students or even try me themselves and then marvel at my ability to come through it. And um, there was no explanation because it, it wasn't through formal study. Well, you know, it sounds to me like true mastery and embodiment of the form. And it's, it seems like that should be our birthright. Why do you think we've gotten away from that? Because we've become attached so much to form. We are essentially spiritual beings, but we become attached to the, the body, to the flesh so deeply that we associate that and all other forms with being ourselves. And so we've gotten away from that. But when we get back into our intuitive being and we relate more back to spirit, we're able to pick up things from that level. And I think that's what I was able to do. So you're saying that the body, it's not that the body's not important, it's just that we've kind of lost sight of all the others? Yes. Yeah, because as a martial artist, I can see that you're very aware of how important the body is. Yes, the body is uh, it's the shell, the housing to which we experience the world. So it is important. Mm. But it's not the motor. Right. How important do you think it is for all of us to experience shifts of consciousness at this particular time? I think it is very important because it allows us to really experience each other more deeply. That the reason we have so many problems in the world, so much violence in the world and all, is because we don't, we don't experience each other spiritually. We don't since that kinship, that oneness that we could, where the love abounds. So that takes us full circle to your feeling from very young of separation. Yes. Do you think that was because you were disconnected or because you were born into a world that was disconnected? I think that um, the world was disconnected. There was cruelty around. You know, I experienced a lot of trouble with bullies when I was growing up. You know, I, I told you I like to sit in the silence and enjoy the peace. But there were bullies that, uh, that uh, affronted me when I was young. And I was always being attacked for no reason. And so uh, I became aware of that problem in the world early. Do you think the bullying drove you to uh, to learn martial arts? I know it did. So it was a gift? Yes. How important is it to be able to see the gift in everything that we see? I think that is vitally important. That even in the troubles, we can find a gift. How can we reframe in order to do that? We just have to look to ask ourselves, what is the message in this? What is the lesson in this? How can I benefit from this? How can a person hope to find their path in these chaotic, chaotic times? The path that's always there in the midst of it. We just have to seek it. Is it a matter of setting our intent and then watching what happens around us? 
it is having a desire for a way out. I'm sorry, I didn't understand what she said. It is having the desire for a way out of the chaotic situation. When we create that desire, the way will manifest. So you're saying we manifest through our desire? Yes. It seems to me like a lot of people don't know what they want. How do you work with that? They might not know what they want, but they know what they don't want. They know they don't want chaos. They know they don't want pain and suffering. And so you start with what you don't want until you find what you do want? That's a, the that's a start. Do you think that the frenzy of our search gets in the way of finding what we seek? The frenzy of our search gets in the way of finding what we seek? I yeah. said, do you think it, yeah, does it get in the way? Yes, because sometimes, because we don't know what we're seeking, we create a lot of false paths. We throw a lot of things in our way that are not necessary. Tell me a little more about that. That's fascinating. Well, we think we know, but we don't. And we have to understand that this path is really a mystery. It does not lie within our realm of cognition as, as does other things. Like, the, like we speak of uh, science and technology, we can take a cell phone apart and eventually we might understand how it works. But on this path of spiritual realization, there is nothing to take apart and we won't know how it works, but we can benefit from it. Is it a matter of being okay with not knowing? Yes. Or do we need or do we need to keep seeking to know? There is something to be said for not knowing. We seek what we must realize that ultimately it lies in the realm of not knowing. Experiencing but not knowing. It's kind of like a state of being then? Yes. The ultimate be here now. Yes. Amazing. Amazing. I'd like to search a little more into that state of being on the other side of this break. Kitabu and I will be back shortly, so don't leave us now. This is the Science of Magic, your resource to altruistic professionals of science and the esoteric, working to create common ground for the betterment of our world. Join our email family to receive our amazing topic-driven episode collections at thescienceofmagic.net. Hi everyone, Rob McConnell here, and I wanted to spend a moment on internet streaming. Everybody has heard about internet streaming, but not many know much about it. Did you know the internet streams just about everything? Movies. From new releases to old classics. TV shows. Almost every show, every episode, and much more. But the question has always been, how do you do it? Well now, thanks to the folks at 123 Ready TV, I have the answer for you. They have developed a simple program app, 123 Ready TV, that you install on your Windows PC, Android smartphone, or Android tablet that can have you streaming like a pro in less than five minutes. You truly won't believe how much is available or how easy it is to do until you try. And for a one-time cost of only $19.99, this product is a real winner. To learn more about 123 Ready TV, visit our website at www.xzbn.net. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, 
Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the X-Zone Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere. 24-7-365. True healing must address four levels, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual, for us to live joyful and productive lives. We tend to treat three of the four, leaving the spiritual languishing. If you're tired of the same dysfunctional patterns cropping up in your life, soul balancing is for you. Trixie Phelps, owner and founder of Soul Balancing, is a naturally gifted energy healer trained in numerous esoteric forms, including shamanism. Trixie has created a powerful modality that safely and effectively clears your energetic field. A soul balancing session can remove interference, heal trauma, and restore your hope. Contact Trixie for a life-changing long-distance session today, www.soulbalancing.world. There's a legend shared by many indigenous cultures of a time when the nations were cast to the four corners of the world. Each nation was given a body of sacred knowledge that held a different portion of the truth to preserve. True reality could not be known until all the nations reunited, combining the information. If a single one was missing, the world could not be reborn and darkness would prevail. The Science of Magic Radio is dedicated to reuniting the sacred knowledge. With the understanding, none of us has all the answers, but together we can open new perceptions and possibilities. Through our combined vision, the world can be reborn into a place where darkness no longer prevails. Join me, Gwilda Wiecka, and the Science of Magic daily on the Exxon Broadcast Network, xzbn.net, or visit us at thescienceofmagic.net. Welcome back. This is the Science of Magic, bringing together gifted people of service to the world. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. What's up in your world? Email me at info at thescienceofmagic.net and suggest a topic that's on your mind. You're probably not the only one interested. Again, our guest this hour is Vernon Kitabu Turner, his website, soulsword.com. Vernon, there, there's this beautiful line in your most recent book, Kiasana Zen. Real peace and certainty is a personal experience. The roots of such virtues do not sink into the soil, but rise up from the soul itself. Would you go into this a little bit for us? Well, what I'm saying there is that real peace comes from within the person. It is now something that is available to everyone at the same time. Each person has to seek it for themselves within their own soul. That is the soul, not the external uh, soul. So when you look within, you can have the peace, and you could be in peace in the midst of turmoil. The whole world could be in turmoil, but you alone could be in peace. What effect does that stance, uh, one of being coming from a place of peace from within, 
what effect does that have on the people around us and on our, and on our world? Well, people who are seekers can sense that in you. And they will come around you and look for answers. You attract people. It's like the teachers attracted me. That, what do they say? When the student is ready, the teacher, the teacher will show up? Yeah, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like that, that, it, that you are available because you're in a state of peace? Yes. And you can sense that around you and be drawn to it and look for help. Each time I was drawn to the person who could help me. But at the same time, I attract people who need help. Isn't that the way life is supposed to work instead of what we're living now? I believe so. Why do we leave peace? It seems like when we're when, before we're born, we're we're in unity. That would be peace. And yet, we're, the, it seems like the minute we're born, we're not peaceful anymore. What, what happens there? We're being pulled more to the external world. We're being pulled more into the world of form, into the world of, what I said, the flesh. We're being pulled into the uh, senses. When, when, as a child, we are more inner directed. We, are, we don't have a attachment to the outer. And so we're at peace. What is a Zen warrior? Now that sounds like an oxymoron. Not really. Because it doesn't necessarily mean you have to fight. But it comes from the unconscious and effortlessness. But um, I can give you an example from my experiences I've traveled around the world giving demonstrations and um, I go to the martial arts schools and they pit me against black belts and I don't fight them but I'm able to stop them. In fact, I'm able to stop them with one finger or just a touch and I don't hurt them. But they are stopped nonetheless because I touch them in spirit and their, their own energy is quelled by that. And they can't explain what happens. They can't explain why they fall. They can't explain why they are stopped, but they are. And what I feel is peace and love. That's the difference. I have no desire to do harm. How can we each embrace the Zen warrior within? Well, I could say read my books. Can that <laughs> help? <laughs> but I don't want to be facetious. <laughs> the, the, um, to find the peace, to search for the peace, to seek only peace, That is what I teach my students, that do not meditate on violence or trying to meet violence with violence, but to meet it with only peace and love. And you will find a way in the middle. It seems like when we're standing in peace, we're standing in trust. And we're standing in peace, trust, and love. We have ultimate mobility. Is, is that what's operating here? Yes. I was um, attacked on the streets a couple of years ago by some men who said they were going to kill me. And um, at that moment, peace came over me. And... Um, they attacked, and I just moved. And I don't even know how I moved. But I do know that in a short period of time, they were running. 
and a witness said that she had never seen anything like it before. Well, I did not hurt them, but they ran. So something they felt within caused them to flee. But with me, I had, I, what I was experiencing was a recognition that this was it, that if I was going to die that day, then I was going to accept it, mm. to embrace it. And in embrace of that, I had no fear. And um, they fled from me. I can understand that. I mean, st somebody that has no fear in the face of death kind of reflects the person's fear back at them in a way, don't they? That's what I believe happened. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I wanted to catch up with them to find out what they felt. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't, don't tell me you chased them down, right? <laughs> no, but here's the irony of the situation. Uh, no, no more than a couple of weeks passed when one of the same people that attacked me actually killed another person mm. and is in prison now for murder. Whoa. Whoa. They robbed and they were, they were trying to rob me. Mm. They robbed and killed another person. Mm. So they weren't bluffing. Yeah, sounds like. Do, do you see your, your life path as been driven by destiny or intention? I think it's a little of both. Because I did not originally have an intention. I was being drawn into this um, situation intuitively. And then it seemed like I couldn't veer, I couldn't cause my path to veer. No matter how much I tried to veer off the path, I was always veering back onto it. Because my life has not always been a constant, you know, I'm not a, uh, I don't consider myself a saint and that I've never done anything wrong or anything like that. That would not be true. But I could never stay off the path. Do you think that's available for all of us? Yes. We have a few minutes left. Tell us about being charged with the bridging the gap between East and West. Well, the Sadhguru said to me in 1982, you are charged with bridging the gap between East and West. And um, we were standing outside of a church. He had just spoken in uh, a church and I helped him set up that uh, meeting. And people were looking toward the East, but they didn't know what to do. They were either embracing it wholeheartedly and leaving behind the West altogether, or they were afraid. So bridging the gap between East and West is realizing that it's not either here or there that there is a middle ground, that we can't throw out all that we are and embrace all that someone else is or something else has, that we have virtues in the West as well, that we have a left hand and a right hand, and both of them are needed, that we have polarities and we need balance. So the mission for me is to be what I am, a person born in the West who haven't tasted the East. And it comes out for me naturally. Well, Just I'm so like, glad. I'm so glad that you are here bracing, embracing both and bringing the balance to us. Thank you so much for being a guest on our show this hour. Thank you, Guadalupe. Mm -hmm. Our guest this hour has been Vernon Kitabo Turner the author of many fine books, including his latest, Kia Sana Zen, Bridging the Gap Between East and West. His website, soulsword.com. This has been The Science of Magic. For in-depth exploration of leading-edge subjects from numerous authorities and viewpoints, join us at thescienceofmagic.net. Until next time, dear ones, may you be blessed with knowledge and comforted with love as you live a life of purpose. Station.